you realize that everyone that comes in after you, you're the, the teacher too. Even though you may not be the sifu of the school, but you're still a teacher. Hey there, everyone, and thanks for listening to episode 25 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the most interesting stories from the best martial artists. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear, as well as great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. You can learn more about our products, like our super comfortable sparring helmet, at whistlekick.com. And you can learn more about the podcast, including all of our past episodes, show notes for this one, and a whole lot more over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're on the website, please sign up for our newsletter. It's full of information, discounts, and other useful martial arts content. And if you're an Android user, you can check out our Android app on the Google Play Store. Just search for Whistlekick. It's an easy way to stay connected with the show, and like everything else related to this show, it's completely free. And now to the episode. Today we're joined by Sifu Alan Goldberg. You may know Sifu Goldberg from a variety of ways. Maybe as the publisher of Action Martial Arts Magazine, or his annual Hall of Honors gathering in New Jersey, or even as a highly acclaimed Wing Chun instructor. As with all of the guests we have here on Martial Arts Radio, Sifu Goldberg loves the martial arts. But unlike other guests, he's found numerous ways to make it part of his life. From teaching to his events to helping others build their businesses, Sifu Goldberg is as busy a man as I've met. We had a great conversation, and I really enjoyed my time with him. So with that, Sifu Goldberg, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Amis. It's my pleasure, and uh, I've been looking forward to getting on the phone with you and speaking about this. Of course, anybody listening picked up on the, the Sifu, so that kind of narrows it down. We know you've got some Chinese arts background there, but why don't you tell us how you got started in the martial arts, when, how, and and all that good stuff. Okay, well, the typical old story, uh, I was mugged coming off from school, and I met a gentleman, and I did start off in the Japanese arts of Shotokan Karate. Uh, I started, met someone, he said, hey, you know, you got yourself mugged, beat up, let's, let's get you a little training under your belt. So I did start with this gentleman, Anthony Arena, back, and I hate to tell you, it's 52 years ago, so I've been doing it for a little while. Sure. That's my basic start of it. Um, years later, I, I kind of went into some of the uh, arts of, of the Chinese arts of five animal kung fu. Uh, studied that for a while, and I met a gentleman back in the early '70s named uh, Jason Lau, who was actually one of the first instructors to ever bring Wing Chun kung fu to the United States. Uh, when I met Mr. Lau, we hit it off. We became great friends right away. I was already an instructor, so we kind of met eye to eye as being instructors. Him being a little older than me, of course. I gave him the credence of being someone that was my elder, of course. And one day he said, hey, would you like to learn Wing Chun Kung Fu? And I just looked at him like, what the heck is that? And he explained it to me. This was the art that Bruce Lee started with. And it kind of intrigued me when he said the name Bruce Lee. And one thing led to another. And I say after about a year of being friends with him, he opened a school in my area. And I actually moved in. It wasn't a school, basically. It was a two floors. It was a Chinese temple with a school base on the first floor. And I had moved in. I told my parents, I'm moving into a Chinese temple, but I'm not shaving my head. So, <laughs> <laughs> How old are you at that time? Oh, I must have been about 18 at the time. Okay. And I was still, still in college. I was traveling every day back and forth to college and working and everything else. Uh, that was probably one of the greatest my experience I've ever had because I kind of lived and breathed and everything I did was Kung Fu oriented. And uh, I don't know many people, you know, they go to a school, they train for a couple of hours and go home. But, you know, when I finished my training, we sat down, maybe took a shower, went out, got something to eat and came back and we trained again. So it was like yeah, constant. It was, it was great. We'd be up to three o'clock in the morning training. So That's fantastic. Was the training the type of training that most of us are used to today, or was it a little more... Well, let's put it this way. Uh, my instructor was a no-nonsense guy, and I could always remember the bamboo stick hitting the back of the legs and, of course, my knuckles and bleeding, <laughs> my knuckles and things like that. It was not um, lawsuit-friendly, <laughs> if you want to say. <laughs> At that time, it, there was no nonsense. And it didn't make us tougher and all, but it made us kind of go back to the original way things were trained then. If you weren't ready you know, to be a martial artist, don't do it. And a lot of guys went through the wayside, but uh, and I stuck with it with a handful of guys. Uh, I'm probably one of the 
pioneers of doing American based Wing Chun. And, uh, to this day, I guess as I said 52 years later, I'm still doing martial arts. So I kind of stuck with it a little bit. <laughs> It's it's core to who you are, absolutely. And yeah. of course, anybody who knows your name knows that you're you're involved in a few things, and I'm sure we'll get into some of those later. Mm. So that that's a great foundation, certainly. Uh, I can imagine you in the temple, and, and I got to say, I'm a, a little jealous of that kind of martial arts upbringing. It's something I wish I had had access to at 18. Yeah. So why don't you th- think for a moment? Tell us your best martial arts story, whether that was in the temple or I, maybe later on. Yeah, I can't even say my best. I had a load of them that were great. Uh, again, just the training in the middle of the night. And uh, I mean, I can go to some other stories that just probably in your hair stand on. And uh, back at the time, there were a lot of Chinese gangs in Chinatown. And we'd be in the middle of Chinatown and run into these guys. And they all knew us as the martial artists. So we didn't become... Uh, associates, but we became friendly with them. So we were always welcomed in the middle of the night in Chinatown until <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning. And there were some hairy times. Uh, I can remember times we had, as they called the Chinatown, Chinatown death matches, where they would have fights and lock the doors. And I was sometimes either a spectator or a couple times I was a bodyguard to one of the fighters. And I tell you something, it was no nonsense. Not what you see today. It was blood all over the place. At the end of the fights, they'd unlock the doors. So, and and when you look back on those times and and those those fights, you know what kind of emotions come up? Is well, that was that a happy time? Or? Yeah, I mean it, it was different, and it was experience that I had that very few other people had. But I look at martial arts, as, not as that being the whole of martial arts. I look at that as being part of it. I mean, you have the sports karate end of it, which is great. I'm not involved with that, but it's a great part of, of the industry. You have the, the children part where people teach the discipline and um, the physical fitness and the emotional and all, the, all those different things that get involved in when you're bringing the child up through martial arts. So you can't take martial arts and just throw it on the table and say, here it is. There are different entities, different parts of it. And then again, when you add on your styles, it changes. It splits up even more so. Right. so. Absolutely. Sure. That was quick. How about how about a second story? Uh, second story. Let's see. Uh, well, when my Sifu was in the United States, we would go uh, traveling around doing movie promotions. And when a lot of the people were seeing these, uh, if you remember the days when all the Kung Fu movies were coming from Hong Kong, we were the school they would call to do promotions in front of the movie set theater. And uh, we traveled up and down the East Coast. It was the greatest time. And we all thought we were movie stars, of course, but we weren't. But it was just a great thing that we'd go off and, uh, you know, be able to get involved with something that was before even the, you know, the Saturday afternoon Kung Fu theater on TV. We were doing it in the theaters, you know, right in the in Chinatown, in New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., all, all over the place. And that was some great times. I, you know, I just remember just loading up a car and taking our equipment and see because where we're going. And, you know, the driver basically knew where we were going. <laughs> None of ourselves did. So we, so you were putting on demonstrations? Yeah, yeah. We put on demonstrations, promotions for the movies, and uh, there were some great films that uh, we got a chance to even watch at the time. So. <laughs> cool. Do you remember any of the, any of the films by name? Uh, there was one, one was really great that we did a lot of work for. It was a movie called Dynasty. And it was the first 3D Kung Fu movie. And, really? Yeah, and it was great. I remember, you know, you stand there and you see the spears coming at your face, and, you know, it was done very well. But, uh, you know, there would, after that, there was maybe one or two other 3D movies, and I don't know why, for what reason, they just stopped making them that way. But it, pretty, it was pretty exciting for, you know, the acting wasn't always the greatest, so, you know, that the 3D actually made it a little better. Yeah. <laughs> So how has the martial arts made you a better person? It's a pretty broad well, question, so I'll let you answer it however. Yeah, you you know, the truth of the matter, the martial arts did make me a better person to a point, but I think me being a teacher is what made me the better person. Okay. Uh, and that doesn't mean that just being a teacher within a school, because when you, you study under the Chinese lineages, you realize that everyone that comes in after you you're the, the teacher, too, even though you may not be the sifu of the school, but you're still a teacher. And it opens a compassion to the younger student that comes in. It opens it opens your mind on top of everything else that other people don't realize. You always become a better instructor when you become a teacher. 
So, you know, over the years of me teaching and realizing, wow, I, you know, you, all the sons and the daughters that I've produced in, in my martial arts schools, you know, it's it's amazing. And I still speak to, I'll say, at least 50 or 60 of them on a regular basis that are not still in the school, that are in different areas or uh, different countries or different cities, uh, states. And, you know, we'll get on the phone and we'll just, you know, talk about anything but it kind of just built a, a relationship that i don't know if you feel it you get it in other sports or other industries you know i don't think there are a lot of coaches let's let's use that term mm. loosely that coach for let's say 30 years mm. and talk with 50 or 60 of their athletes yeah years later i you know um that's, that says something about you and, and about your dedication to the arts, for sure. Well, there, there are people that take that upon themselves that want to do it. Uh, I kind of just felt that it was something I had to do, and by doing it, it opened up a different door for me. Because, you know, just being an instructor and sending people home all the time is not the way. I mean, even to this day, I still teach, and I, I'm opening. There's a whole group of people I had during the summer, and they can't come anymore because of school. So now we're opening a Sunday class. And oh, wow. the only reason I'm doing that is because I feel bad they're not training anymore. Uh, do I need to put an extra day in? And not really, because it's not about the money. But I realized I had at least a half dozen of these students that were yearning. I just got a text this morning from someone that was begging me to have the Sunday classes. So mm-hmm. it, it kind of opens up a different end to you when you start to be a teacher. And, you know, being a promoter also, like, it's something I haven't told the audience, but I'm, I'm probably one of the premier martial art promoters in the world. Uh, I run an event called the Mega Weekend, the Action Martial Art Mega in Atlantic City. And we have the largest event. Uh, we have over 1,200 people at our banquet, trade show, 5,000 people. And what's happened is all my students from all over the country, once a year, come in to that event. So it's a get together for our little family, and they help me run the event on top of it. And it's a great feeling. You know, one by one, they start piling into the hotel from Tennessee or Virginia or California. And, I, again, I don't think you get that in a lot of other industries. And it, it's always warmed my heart to know that they have people that care enough that want to do that. Because you could finish your training and go home, and it's over and done with otherwise. So let's kind of switch gears here. Okay. I'd like you to think about maybe some of the rougher points that you've been through. Think about one of them in particular and how your martial arts experience or training helped you overcome it. Well, I, I'm a businessman by heart. I have, I own a few businesses and of course, like every other business, you have those problems where the bills may not be getting paid. Mm -hmm. And I always go back to my martial art uh, spirit and makes me work harder because I realize I had to do it, and that, that martial art kind of just striving to always go forward makes me do it. Now, <laughs> people say to me, well, you, know, you live well, you do this, and I say, yeah, but it doesn't come easy. But the martial arts has always given me, when I did old bills and didn't weren't able to pay them right away, I, I just sat down and made sure I did something else that turned my, you know, my business around. So it definitely helped me, uh, maybe not in the the sense of fighting or anything, but it definitely did the spirit itself. So if there was someone listening to this podcast right now and they're at some early stage of a business or or maybe not even early stage, they have a business and the business is not cash flow positive, we want Mm -hmm. to borrow a business term, what what would you say to them if they were right in front of you? How would you – Take what you just said and, and it's, boil it off for them. It's fairly simple. You always got to remember there's one way that you think is going to work, and then when you find 10 more that are going to work. So, you know, if you think you're at the, that, that road, that it's the end of the road, it's never true. You'll always find a way around it. And it's happened to me personally. So I know I, you know, my event, I, I give the audience a little background. I, I don't mind saying it. I've run my event 16 years, it will be this year. Uh, for the first 11 years, I actually lost my shirt. Huh. And putting this in, people look at me and whatever, and I always say, well, I, I've lived a fa- fairly blessed life. So, you know, if I don't have one thing coming from another, I get it from another. But now that I've built to the point, I'm, I'm making a profit off of what I do. And 
I guess it's perseverance too. But if you don't have that, that kind of burning feeling to make it work, uh, that aspiration to make yourself better than you were the day before, uh, it's not going to, you got to do it. You got to push. And you know, my, my true thing is I started in my magazine. It's uh, going on 24 years now when I started and no one thought I'd be able to even get off the ground with it. And with 24 years later, and we must have saw over a hundred guys that tried the same thing I did and we're the only one left. So, you know, pushing yourself, it, martial art has helped that way. Definitely. Think now through some of the people that you've worked with. You've, you've certainly had some impressive people. You, <clears throat> excuse me. You know everybody. I know that. You've met everybody. And I'm sure you've had a chance to train with a lot of those people. Mm-hmm. So who out of that group, other than the people you would have called your own instructors, would you say was most influential in your martial arts upbringing? I have, I have a funny background because when I train with someone, I don't accept knowledge or ranks from other people when I'm under them. So when I wasn't with somebody, uh, I did meet, you might not know, but Yip Man was Bruce Lee's instructor. I did meet his sons and I was able to kind of get a little more of the history and background so that that always pushes you forward to want to learn more. Um, I've been, again, I'm doing this 52 years, and you, you think, hey, you, you know everything you got to know. It's, it's not true, because there's always history, and there's, you know, other things that come along with your martial arts that are not just part of the fighting. So, I mean, I, I have to say the Yip Man family, and, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a great honor meeting them. So, Yip Man himself was, had passed, but his sons were still alive. What kind of martial artists were they compared to? I mean, it, their father is certainly a legend. Right. Uh, I have to be honest with you, not as good as I thought they would have been, but that didn't take anything away from them who they were. Sure. Um, you know, we as Americans have taken a lot of the Chinese arts and Japanese arts and so on and so forth and have made them better because maybe we're the, just bigger and stronger or whatever. So, you know, my Wing Chun is as comparable as anyone's going to become out of Hong Kong or come out of China because the old American spirit. You know, I haven't changed it much, but again, I'm I'm a 210 pound guy, fairly in good shape, and you run into someone who's you know half your size. And uh, it's funny, I went to a meeting once. A good story. <laughs> I had went to a meeting once, and there was when I had met Yip Man's sons, and there were a bunch of other instructors in the room, and everyone started working with each other. And I got up in the middle of the floor, and I started trying to work with people, and nobody would touch me. I felt like I had I had the cooties or something. I don't know. <laughs> and the room the room was filled with instructors. And finally, you know, I approached someone. And I said, "What the hell's going on here?" And they said to me in these words, "Mr. Goldberg, you are a big American that knows the same thing we know. So we we didn't want to touch your hands. No, they they possibly were afraid of being embarrassed because of my size and I was you know strong. I don't know." And I just laughed at it, and I said, well, then again, I, I, then I made my point without even having to touch anybody. So, <laughs> cool. I've had, that, I've had that a few times in my life, though. So. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that the dream of martial arts, is to never have to use it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, I've gained a lot of notoriety in the industry. As you mentioned, I know uh, some of my best friends, uh, Gary Tagawa from Mortal Kombat, Chuck Zito. Uh, I work with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, just about every celebrity, Michael J. White, we're very dear friends, Bill Wallace. So, you know, I've had a blessed life in the martial art world because it's not only did I meet these people, most of the time, I'll, even next week, I have Don the Dragon coming into town. We're promoting his new movie, which I'm an associate producer of. And I get to hang out with Don and, you know, do things with Don. So it's not as a fan, not just someone you know. We're personal friends. And to me, I call that a blessed part of my life that I'm able to call these people my friends and know something that I'm not starstruck at all. What I feel is that not nice people, I walk away from them. There was a gentleman, I won't even mention the name, but he was from a TV show called Sopranos, I'll leave it at that, that I took his number and I threw it in the garbage because I did not appreciate the person. Uh, I have also guys like Joe Piscopo who's one of my students. Joe is one of the most wonderful people uh, that you'll ever meet. 
this is a good person to me. Uh, matter of fact, last year he on my event, he actually sang at my event. So again, these are the friendship ends that, that come from the martial art world. And I consider myself blessed because of that. Sure. Now, you said you don't get starstruck. No. Have, have you always been that way? Uh, maybe not. Maybe at the beginning, you know, you get uh, you see someone, wow, wow, look who that is, you know. But I think after you get to realize that they're just like you, you don't, you kind of just uh, shrug it off. I, I recently met uh, Kevin Swobo, and I see him standing there. He was coming to my event a couple of years ago, and he gets out of the limousine, and I start walking over. Now, you know, starstruck I wasn't, but I was... Definitely, you know, great to meet the guy because, you know, I watched him on TV. As, you know, it was Hercules all these years. Sure. And he comes running over to me, shaking my hand. Oh, Mr. Colbert, how are you? What an honor. And I just look, and it kind of, that kind of spun my head a little because I'm, <laughs> I wasn't expecting those things. Yeah. And it just, it, it, that showed me that he was a good person. That, you know, it wasn't a matter of he was at an event and he just wanted to be part of it and he was excited and, hey, that, that's what it's all about, you know? Now, I'm, I'm going to connect some dots here and, mm-hmm. and ask a question that's not even on our, on our list, but it sounds like you might ascribe some of your success to treating people the right way Yeah. for all these years, and then it's coming back to you. Would, I, I'm known for two things. <laughs> I'm known for being the nicest guy in the world, and I'm known for being the biggest SOB in the world. <laughs> okay. Okay. And it's exactly what you say there. And I, you know, color or creed or race never touches me. That way, one of my very dear friends again is uh, Phil Morris. He's one of my associate students. And Phil's from the uh, Seinfeld show. If you remember the lawyer? Yeah. Phil is one of my, well, I wouldn't say my student, but one of my associate students. Okay. And Phil's. Great. I treat him like a brother. I mean, one of my guys that actually lives in one of my uh, apartments, my properties, is uh, Demetrius Oaktree Edwards. He's the heavyweight kickboxing champion, the guy that broke Tyson's ribs in 91. He's still with me after 30 years. And I still, you know, take care of him. I, you know, there's a whole uh, array of things that you have to know to be the person you want to be and not look anything for it. And I've taken care of many people over my life doing this. Um, and again, color, creed means nothing, but I'm the type of guy, if I don't like you, you know, it, <laughs> you definitely know it. So I'm, they just gave me a name recently in the industry. They call me chairman of the board. So I looked at the guy and said, what the hell are you calling me that for? He goes, well, you're like Frank Sinatra. You're the chairman of the board. He goes, you're on top of the world. I says, yeah. I said, and there's always someone trying to knock you off there. So. Yep. You know, I laugh at that, but it, it was a great compliment. Yeah, it, it, I mean, to, to be given the same nickname as Sinatra, mm-hmm. that's, as soon as you said it, I knew right where where it was coming yeah. from. I, I don't sing either, so. <laughs> <laughs> that makes two of us. Yeah. Never wanted, if I'm singing, you should probably run the other the way. The other way, right. But again, you know, it's, it's about, you know, being nice to people, being back, and once I get that negativity, there are a handful of guys in this industry, I wouldn't give them the time of day. And I just look at them like, you know, who the hell do you think you are? You know, really? And you're only as good as your last event or your last outing or anything you do. And I've kind of taken some advice from some of the celebrities I know because they're more in the limelight than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And you kind of see the guys that get places, and I don't mean by even success in the industry, but just get places in their life. And, uh, again, like a guy like Joe Piscopo, I mean, he has a radio show now, and I call up, and he always says, I'll call in, call in, you know? And I get on the phone with him, and uh, one, one day we had uh, Bernie Carrick, the New York City Police Commissioner, on, and I know Bernie very well also, <laughs> the three of us. And I actually couldn't stay on the phone anymore with them because I was laughing so hard from the, th- you know, the <laughs> two of them uh, just being on the phone. But you, you kind of you have to appreciate life, and the martial art world has re- brought me just – wonderful instances that I don't think I would have got any other way. You know, why would they even want to speak to me if they weren't involved in something that would be interesting? So. Now, I, I just want to go back to something you said, and I don't, I'm not going to ask you to name the names of the people that you won't give the time of day to, but mm-hmm. maybe you could give us an example of why certain people have... Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you. Well, no, I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say it. There's one gentleman who had a movie out uh, 30 years ago, 
um, that made one movie and he kind of flopped because of his attitude. It wasn't just what I don't like before, but his attitude in the industry, no one deals with him. And everyone I spoke to told me, oh, they've had their run-ins with him, whatever. And he had come to my event and I had given him <laughs> an envelope with his dinner tickets in it and the package and free drink coupons and so on, so on, so forth. And the only thing he was interested in was just getting his VIP pass out and he threw the tickets away. So I didn't see him at my banquet, and I'm wondering what the hell happened. So he calls me up and goes, well, you didn't invite me to the I says, excuse me, did you get an envelope? He goes, yeah. I said, well, knucklehead, everything was inside that envelope. <laughs> and I just shook my head. And after that, I mean, he didn't want to come to my event anymore because he felt he was this. And I just looked. I said, listen, you're not invited anywhere else. It doesn't matter. No one else wants you. And I just hung on the phone up on the guy. Mm. And it's just you know they 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 um, they think who they who they want to be more than who they are, and that's what they, you know the problem. So I kind of just walk away from guys like that now. I'll tease. I actually this one person which I can won't mention the name. I tease the hell of him every time I see him. I look at him, you know, I tell him things like, you know, they sell those clothes at Baby Gap. They're still on sale, you know. Things like that. <laughs> And I, and people laugh. I tear them up. I just, I, you know, and as I say, that's why I'm known either as the greatest guy in the world or the biggest son of a shit in the world. So. <laughs> <laughs> either one. How about how about competition? Were you were you ever much of a competitor? Most of the competition that we did were all inter school, so there was never really tournament based. And the reason why, because we were for contact. Mm. Uh, I trained some guys for contact kickboxing, but I myself never went to it. But, you know, a lot of the things we did were just into school, full contact fighting. You know, I fought a little here and there. But I have to be honest with you, and, uh, you know, not to talk in a bad way, most of our fighting was in the streets back in the old days. We mm. we lived in a very uh, rough area. And me, my instructor, and a few other guys, we were constantly getting in arguments and fights in the streets. And uh, there were a couple of local newspapers written up on us, calling us vigilantes and things like that. And uh, it was a fun were time. You, were, were you going out seeking trouble? Well, I couldn't say that. Okay. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. We would finish class, and occasionally we'd walk up to the local coffee shop, which was about five to six blocks away from the school, and at, you know, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, you'd always find someone doing something that was wrong. Mm. And it got to the point where the police just used to turn their heads every time we did something because we were doing jobs that they couldn't do. Not to put me in any type of uh, legal matter, so. Sure. Well, you know, statute of limitations. Yeah, on, yeah you're right. On, you're I'm going to guess most of that is, has probably passed, but we won't yeah. get too specific in that way. Yeah. Nothing can be held against you. Yeah. Who who would you love to have trained with or, or still train with? You know, be alive or dead. I mean, was, you mentioned Bruce Lee as as an influence. Would it be well, him? Bruce Lee was an influence. I don't know if I want to train with him because uh, I've I've trained with people that were his seniors here actually, and Bruce Lee. I hate to tell the audience this wasn't as much as people thought he was. He was an innovator in his own right. He was a, a you know a entertainer in his own right. But as a martial artist, he was limited. Believe it or not. You're not and, the first person to say that on this show. Uh, oh, I'm the one that knows it, though, because my instructors were with him in Hong Kong. Wow. And they would tell me, you know, he was a great guy, flashy, the whole nine yards. And there's stories about Bruce Lee that when he was thrown out of the Yip Man School, uh, he moved into, I think the name was Kwang Avenue, one of the streets that they had. He got an apartment there, and he painted all the windows black. Now, this is a story very few people know. And what Bruce did, he put a big light bulb up in the back of the room that gave reflections into the window so it looked you could see his reflection slightly, but you couldn't actually see who it was. And Bruce would turn this big bright light on, and he'd work out in the room for hours until there were people all over the street just watching. So Bruce built a reputation, as I say again, showman, that other people never saw before in Hong Kong. And as a fighter, Bruce was not a fighter. Bruce never fought a day in his life. So, you know, even the movie you see where he's supposed to have fought, Bruce never fought. Okay. So who would it be if not Bruce? Wow. Um, probably a guy like maybe his partner, Danny. 
Uh, Danny is actually not his student, is his actually partner. And Danny, um, you know, is a man that uh, had a lot of knowledge, not so much Wing Chun or anything that would, you know, that I do, but another a screamer and you know a stick fighting thing like that. Where I love to have learned things like that. So Dan, Dan would probably be one of them. Uh, probably Wally J from the Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. Uh, I did. I never say worked with Wally, but I knew Wally when he was alive. Um, I also had a, a thing called Action Martial Art Trading Cards that I did. Oh, probably ten decks. I did over a million cards, and Wally was in one of my cards at the time. So you know, I did have some relations, but it, I did respect him a lot. Yeah, certainly uh, uh, well respected and. Yeah, uh, pioneering man in the arts. Mm-hmm. Other than that, uh, I'm not too many, very honestly. Again, when I when I say to you that I, I've been I'm one of the dinosaurs in the arts, there weren't too many guys before me. <laughs> there were some, but not too many. So movies are are movies a big thing for you? Which yeah, I'm movies? involved with a lot of movies right now. I'm I'm uh, okay. executive producer of a movie called The Beast, which is we just filmed something out in Philadelphia. I'm associate producer of a movie called The Martial Art Kid with Don Wilson and quite a few others, actually. It's about 10 movies under my belt. As a martial art movie fan, I, I guess I got to tell you what everyone else would say is Enter the Dragon. Yeah. You know, And one of the movies, which I had to tell you, and, and I just said Jason Statham is a very good friend of mine. Um, Jason, his fight scene in uh, his first movie, to me, was like the greatest fight scene, you know, ever. Transporter. Yeah. That was, to me, the best fight scene ever put together in a martial art movie. It's fantastic. It, it's It's been a while since I've seen that movie. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I, I have distinct memories of watching that and thinking, what kind of martial arts has this guy done? Yeah. And, you know, Jason Statham has come up as, a, uh, a favorite actor. Oh, yeah. That's our next question is favorite martial arts actor. Yeah. Um, several people that have guessed it on the show have said, I don't really know his martial arts background, but oh, Jason I, Statham. I do. <laughs> he actually studies some Wing Chun. Okay. Yep. And actually, when he comes to New York, he'll be studying with me. But uh, Jason has done, you know, other styles of kickboxing, karate, but he does a lot of Wing Chun in his fighting. But Jason, believe it or not, is in such good shape. He was a diver. And a swimmer. So his yeah. physique and physical fitness came from, you know, a lot of swimming. So, Interesting. Yeah. And he's one of the, I have to be honest with you, we hung out quite a few times, and me, him, Chuck Guido, um, <laughs> Randy Control, we went out one night, and I had to be honest with you, what a night. And Jason, and Randy also, but Jason turned out to be one of the, the nicest guys you'd ever want to hang out with. Just oh, a okay. great, great person. Uh, in fact, he's supposed to be at my event this year. He uh, committed that he was coming this year to my event. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, but I always uh, see what movie starts. It always has to do with their schedule. So yeah. that's what happened last year. He was supposed to come, but he was stuck in, uh, I think, Bangkok at the time. So. Well, we're certainly going to have links to your event in the show notes, but this this is a good time maybe to tell people about it, and then we'll come back to some other questions. Sure. Well, again, I, I run 16 years as the largest martial in the world called the Action Martial Art Mega Weekend, held in Atlantic City, the Tropicana Hotel. Uh, you can check it out. on My website is hohmega.com. Uh, you can always find me on Facebook. I always have things up on the Alan Goldberg Sifu. Um, and we run an event that's nothing like anyone's ever seen. Our banquet alone has 1,200 people. We have parties on uh, Friday night. We have five, 600 party people at the party, which... Believe it or not, it's filled with celebrities. They just come in, hang out, drink, dance. Uh, last year, I had Ray Mercer, on the, the boxing champion, on the floor dancing for like an hour and a half. We had to take him off the floor. He was going crazy. <laughs> also, and that's what I, I get a lot of people like that. I mean, I mean, Jace, recently you saw Jimmy Superfly Snooker just got locked up recently. He was in the news. And Jimmy, he was always at my event. He was a couple times. Uh, Dan Severin, uh, Don the Dragon, Cynthia Rothrock, Michael J. White, Bill Wallace. I, the, the list is endless. Uh, we had Bei Ling last year. The, the Chinese actress was there. Um, it's My event is weird because all of a sudden people just show up at my event. Celebrities because they hear so much about it. And our mm. trade show last year alone was over 5,000 people. We had four tournaments this year. We have five tournaments going on. Um, over 70 free seminars, uh, trade, I mean, it's just, 
It's like a Disney World for martial arts. Let's just put it that way. And it's held in the great show place, the Tropicana in Atlantic City. January 22nd, 23rd, 24th. Cool. Well, we'll, you know, again, for listeners, we'll have links to all that mm-hmm. information that, that Sifu mentioned in, in the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. All right. So let's, let's pull it back in. So okay. we talked about movies. How about actors? Well, I got to say, Jason. <laughs> yeah. I, you know something, too? You know, I, when I look at the martial art industry with actors, I know them all. <laughs> just about. Or if I met them, at least. So um, I'll give you one who's, you know, a little underrated, uh, Michael Jai White. And Michael, as a martial artist, is so good that, you know, he kind of said to me two years ago, he goes, listen, is I don't want to be known as the actor anymore at your event. I want to be known as the martial artist because we are dealing with just martial art people. And I said, you're right. So last year, the first time ever, Michael came to the event and put a free seminar on, a martial arts seminar on how he fights. And he had to have 100 people in the room with him. Sure. And it was something that he said he appreciated that so much because now he was able to show he just wasn't another pretty face on the screen. So, right. you know, Michael is a little underrated at the point as a, as a martial artist in the industry. Um, you have another guy like Kari Tagawa, or a very dear friend of mine. Also, you know, I'm, uh, I'm kind of a little bit of a confidant with him. I help him business-wise with things. And Kari's also a great martial artist, uh, a little different than other ones in the fighting end. He's more of a healer in the martial art end than he does a, is a fighter. But it still brings such a different aspect of what he does. Um, got a guy right here, right in New York right now, my dear friend James Liu. He's working on the TV show Luke Cage, which he has a role for me, supposedly. <laughs> and uh, he's doing all the stunt coordination, and James is a phenomenal martial artist. But people, again, he's not rated like uh, like the Jet Lees and people like that. Um, you got Dan Don the Dragon, Cynthia Rothrock. Great yeah. people, great, I mean, two of the greatest people. I mean, we travel all the time together. Um, cool and you know I, I didn't realize that you were involved in the martial arts kid that's that's some yeah a film that i don't know that we've talked about it on the show but it's certainly it's made it into the social media stuff that we've done mm-hmm. with whistle kick so All right. yeah, that's I'm, cool maybe uh, working with them actually on the 18th we're having some show uh a showing on the 18th and the 20th in new york oh that's great mm. so Right here in New York, and people can come down, take a look. Uh, if you go to my Facebook, it's all up all over my Facebook page. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. So how about books? Are you a reader? Any? <sighs> you know the truth? I don't have much time. Um, okay. I, I've read books, of course, in the past. Uh, Book of Five Rings, uh, The Art of War. But um, as a reader, no. I, I'm more of a, a type of guy grab an article out of a magazine and read it like that. Fast and I pick a book up because I never I never finish it. That's the real problem. <laughs> yeah, just don't have the time. So you know, give me a couple page article, I read it. So how about what's keeping you going with your? I mean, training for you might be a broader term because you're you're doing so much for the martial arts outside of a training space. Mm-hmm. But what's keeping you motivated to, you know, keep yourself going with that? Well, you know, it, it again. I, when people join my school, I tell them, you're not joining a school, you're joining a family. And that's what I've built. Uh, I just, I, got, I won't mention her name on the phone, but I had one of my girl students last night is getting divorced. She came to the school. We sit and talk for an hour. I took her out to dinner. We talked. So what happened was, you know, I became her second, you know, her surrogate father, her second father in the world that, you know, sometimes you can't tell your father things. Mm-hmm. And you need another person. And that's what's become the myth. So, you know, I, I love seeing uh, people, get, like a, it's a seed or a sponge, you give them a little bit and it starts to grow or a sponge just absorbs so much. And that's satisfaction, you know, just seeing that happen. Um, I do my martial arts, believe it or not, I'll tell the audience, I don't make money off my school. i lucky I pay my rent in the school. We have great people, guys that can't afford the, you know, the dues. I let them go because I don't do it for the money. Right. And I just feel if I turn someone down because they can't pay dues and their heart so much in it, well, there's other ways they can earn their, you know, their tuition, if you want to say. 
And that's what keeps so, me going in the martial art world. I mean, I, I again, I feel I have a very blessed life in what I've done. Uh, I started off my magazine, and it, it's become a vehicle for me. And I always say, without my magazine, I probably would have been Alan Goldberg who. And I and I, I know that. I'm, you know, I'm a realist about that. But now when I go somewhere and I, I you know, I go to events, it, it's, you know, I, I hate to say people, you know, treat me differently, but it's always, you know, people always come over taking photos of me and hold on you. And I laugh at it because I'm still Alan Goldberg, the guy that walked, you know, in 25 years ago the same way, so. Yeah. How do, how do you feel when they do that? I mean, does that make you feel uh, yeah, it makes good? You feel good. Contribution? Yeah, it makes you feel good, of course. Um, it doesn't blow my head up in, in the way that some people might think it does because they're like I might have been 25 years ago when I ran into, uh, you know, Don the Dragon and I wanted to take his photo with him. And, you know, I, you, when you get to know guys like Don, you know that he's the person that wants to be involved with his fans. And I never say I have fans, but... Maybe I do. I, I I don't know. I never look at it that way. Well, you certainly have people that that admire you and what you've done for the community. Yeah. Well, I appreciate them as much as they appreciate me too. So, so why don't you tell us now? I mean, you told us a little bit about what's going on. Uh, we kind of danced around the magazine. Why don't you tell us about Action Martial Arts? Okay. Well, 1990. Uh, I met a gentleman. We, had, we did a show be called, called Masters in Action, and we started the show because one of my kung fu brothers couldn't pay the rent in a school, so I said, let's do a show. And I put together some of the greatest masters in the New York area. And we put the show together, and we turned away, God, like 600 people at the front door. And we it just blew everyone away. And we put the show on, and we paid his rent up for the year, and it was all great. And the gentleman who was there who worked for a local newspaper goes, wow, you guys are really something. I've never, you know, I've been around the martial art world. I've never seen anything like this locally. You know, I said, well, you know, we put our hearts into it and it worked. He goes, how would you like the guys to do a magazine? And I looked at him like, what the hell I know about doing a magazine? <laughs> we sat down and I remember the first time we did it, we did a 16 page newsprint. And we had no idea what the hell we were doing. I swear when I tell you, I, we were cutting and pasting. It wasn't the day of the computers, of course. Uh, I think it was more typewriters than anything else. And we were just yeah. cutting and pasting things down. When we went to it, we found a local guy that did the penny saver. And we asked him if he would print it for us. And he looked at us. He goes, yeah, I could bind it and print it for you, but you only have 12 pages. So we go, well, what do we need? If you need multiple, you need 16 pages multiple. So we opened our wallets up and we pulled out our business cards. <laughs> we blew up our business cards on the last four pages in the magazine, so-called. And we put it to press and we, we, we printed up like four or 5,000 copies and we started going out. And it looked like crap, <laughs> very honestly. But there was nothing else out there. And after, I'll say... A couple of years, we kind of went to a color cover, and then of course, computers were coming along, and we started using some. We we're cutting and pasting everything with. Uh, remember the old Dyna, Dynamo uh, name name maker? Yeah. Well, we were using that for headlines. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. It, it was so we were so backward. We had no idea, but it started to make a little bit of a noise, and people. Next thing you know, everyone wanted to be in the magazine, and I had two partners that were with me. And it wasn't even the guy from the newspaper. He actually was just our editor at the time. And I had two other guys. So we had the, from the show we did, it was the three of us. And then I wound up finding out that I was doing most of the work. I shouldn't say most of it. I was doing all the work. <laughs> and I also put up $10,000 of my own money to produce the magazine, to print it. And we get an advertising, but it wasn't enough. So, uh, listen, it, it was, again, a great way, a vehicle to get to the next level. And eventually I got rid of the two partners because they would come in and throw things at the desk to make sure, make sure it gets in the magazine. And finally, my editor said, screw you. And we changed everything around, pulled it away from the federation we had, and we started the magazine over under the same name, Action. And uh, we went to full color print. We were printing in Canada, and we were printing in China. And actually now we print back here in the United States. So... Digital printing has come a long way uh, within, you know, the services that the uh, U.S. 
printers can do, and it was actually worth a while to come back to the U.S. and print. So we're actually in our 83rd issue right now, and uh, sometimes I was I was going through some archives the other day, and I just looked at it, and I started going with some of the old copies. And unfortunately, enough, every page I turned, there was someone that passed already, someone I knew, and I just I, it was very melancholy. I really, you know, I said, "Wow!" I said, "Thank God I'm still around," but man, this is weird. And uh, I love doing it. I actually didn't do one last year. I had some uh, my own physical problems, kidney stones, and this other stuff. So I put the magazine to bed for one year. And I will be, will be coming back to print this coming year now. And uh, actually, if you go to my website, there's one of our last issues that are up there. You actually can flip through to it and look online. And it's just, now we're full color. Uh, it's all PDF files, download, nothing like running to a printer in the middle of the night. And uh, it's great. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's come, brought me a long way. And one thing I learned at the very beginning, though, when I did the magazine, I think it was because of my two partners originally. I never put my picture in the magazine. Uh, I think I put together close to about 65 magazines, and I would be maybe in a group shot or, you know, maybe in passing of a photo, you see me in the background, but I never put my picture in it. And finally, I went to an event one day, which I was the guest of honor. This was down south. I was the guest of honor, and everyone was waiting for me to come in. I walk in the room, and I walking around the event, and nobody knew who I was. <laughs> And I'm sitting there going, wow, something, this is wrong. And finally, when I heard my name, people, oh, Mr. Goldberg, oh, such an honor to have you. And it was, you know, of course, nice once I knew who I was, but I realized they didn't know what I looked like. So now, from that issue, I probably was number 65 or whatever issue, I started to make a little passport photo of me inside the first page on the directory, Alan Goldberg's Action Martial Art Magazine, my little photo. And that's it. I, I don't, you know, I don't push myself as a rule. Uh, I learned a long time ago is when they build it, they'll, you know, when you build it, they'll come. And that's exactly what happened. So it wasn't important that I had to put my face in there. Uh, my name did enough. But then again, when I went out, people didn't know what I looked like. <laughs> so, oh, what a riot. Yeah. Anything else before we come to our last question that you want the listeners to know? Um, you know about anything you've got going on, or you want people to? Yeah, I, I'm in, well. I'm involved. I think you said it. Oh, you heard I was the busiest guy in the martial art world. <laughs> uh, I'm always involved with something new. I just got a new energy drink called Jersey Pump, which look for on your shelves soon. Um, I'm involved with a lot of movies. I've got like six movies I've done in the last year that I'm involved with. Um, I'm just a million different things I'm involved with all the time. So uh, one guy said to me, all the roads lead to Alan Goldberg. And I laugh. <laughs> I said, it's not really true other than that I try to help everybody. And uh, there's a gentleman just came out with, you remember Black Belt Cologne from years ago? Yeah. And he reproduced it, just came out last year. And I'm involved now helping him putting that back on the market. So okay. uh, I work with Arnold Schwarzenegger at the Arnold Classic. I'm on the board of directors for that. So that's a lot of fun. So anyone gets a chance to come down to the Arnold. I work with the tournament down there, and I work with Arnold directly. Um, it's a fun life. I, I've done – I have a, a very rich background in my martial art world. And I am a martial artist, so it's not a matter of me just <laughs> being a promoter. I'll give you a quick one. Don the Dragon, Yeah. we were very good friends, but Don picked me up at the airport probably – this got about eight years ago, nine years ago. Don picked me up the airport, we went out to eat, and he says, all right, what are we doing? I said, well, i got to do a seminar tomorrow night. Come on over. He says, doing a seminar? What? I said, at my school. I have a school in California. He says, well, I didn't know you, you taught. And I looked at Don. I said, what do you mean you didn't know I taught? He says, I just thought you were a martial art promoter. Don, Don came to the school. He sat there for four hours with his hand. He got up, and he bowed to me, and he looked at me. He goes, Grandmaster. He goes, thank you. Now I know I can bow to you, and that's not as a promoter. And I laughed, and I told Don, Don, I'm still the same guy. And we, we've, you know, we just picked the phone up and call each other. And his brother, I don't know if everyone knows, James Wilson is his brother. And uh, James and Don are two of the best people you're going to run into in the industry. Two great, great human beings. They really are. So. Well, you certainly have a lot of wonderful people and a lot of wonderful projects around you. And. Uh, you keep calling your life blessed, and I, I think that's probably a pretty good description because I'm listening to it and, and hoping I can someday construct a life similar, you know, with having 
such wonderful people around mm -hmm. me. And uh, I, I really thank you for being here. And I'm just hoping you might let us end by offering some, some advice, some parting advice for the people listening. Well, okay. It's simple, uh, but always think as if your fist is as big as your heart, you're on the right track. Always give your heart before you give your fist. And, you know, you martial art worlds, you know, there's so many different ends of what we do. And we get to respect everything, you know. At my event, it's, you know, everyone comes and open doors for every style. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Wonderful. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I really appreciate everything you've had me on here and talk about. You brought up some old memories also. So. Good. <laughs> that was a great day. Thank you for listening to episode 25 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and a huge thank you to Sifu Goldberg. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would make a big difference. Those reviews help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com, and you'll get a free prize pack, including a shirt, water bottle, stickers, and a bunch more. And we'll even pay the shipping. And don't forget to tell your friends about the show. Word of mouth is the way that we're growing most. You can check out the show notes with photos and links to everything we talked about today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can keep up on all things Whistlekick. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And check out the great stuff we have at whistlekick.com. Gear, shirts, pants, and a whole bunch more. All made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.